So let's start by a general review or overview of what we have here. So ovarian tumors, we're going to assess in different ways and they're going to have different appearance both in ultrasound or MRI or even CT. And the important thing is to have a concept or a mental concept of separating all this in three main components. As you see here, we have the three main types of ovarian tumors and the first one being epithelial. Epithelial is going to be the most common one. Here I wrote about 70% of the cases. And here we're going to have the mucinous and the serous type. Those two types are very often discussed and they should not be confused with mucinous and serous carcinoma of the pancreas. Okay, although similar terminology, two very different things. As far as the age, there's not a really uh, a lot of age distinction between mucinous and serous. The main distinction between these two is that the serous uh, cystadenoma, and here we also need to clarify the terminology. So we're going to have cystadenoma and we're going to have cystadenocarcinoma. And there's going to be a spectrum of disease with this two, whether we consider one or the other to be benign or malignant. Obviously, the carcinoma one is going to be the malignant one, but both of them are going to are going to undergo surgery, surgical resection to remove them. So, as far as making the diagnosis, we need to know that the serous uh, part will be more closely correlated to a tumor marker that's called CA125. And although mucinous can have the same marker, and pretty much all of the ovarian tumors are going to have some type of relationship with that marker, serous is the one that correlates the best. So we have better results when we follow it. And it's important to mention that the CA125, we use it mainly to follow up disease and to assess for progression or remission. It's not very useful as an initial diagnostic marker because you can have false positive and false negatives. And what that means is that sometimes we might be missing something if we only rely on CA125 or we might be over diagnosing uh, a lesion that might be produced by something else that's not a tumor. That being said, mucinous and serous, another important component is that uh, some of them are going to be bilateral. And the main thing is that the serous type is also going to be the one that's more commonly bilateral. So that's an important concept to have in mind. And also the malignant types of both serous and mucinous are also going to be more often bilateral. So bilaterality, in a sense, we can see it almost as a not a very good marker uh, or prognosis since a lot of the malignant ones will tend to be bilateral and the benign, the percentage for bilateral tumors is going to be a little bit lower. When we move on to germ cell tumors, these are going to be around 10 to 15 percent uh, and, and sex cord stromal tumors are going to be 10 percent or less. So although they're very similar in distribution, germ cell tumors are usually going to be more common. And here we have the teratoma and that's the main one. We also know it as dermoid. Some people might have uh, different names, but this is the, the main tumor that you need to know. Um, However, we're still going to have other tumors in this category that we should know. So, for example, we have the choriocarcinoma, the yolk sac uh, tumor, and the dysgerminoma. We also have the embryonal, uh, embryonal cell carcinoma, that's the ECC there. And they're going to be germ cell tumors. They are going to have, aside from the teratoma, all the other ones, they're going to have different uh, appearance and it might be hard to distinguish them. The next one is the sex cord stromal tumor, and this is gonna be around less than 10% of the tumors that we that we see in the ovary. Most of them are considered low grade, like we say here. They have some hormonal uh, effect, mainly precocious puberty is gonna be the, the one that presents, and some of them are gonna have virilization. This is another one in which the terminology might be confusing. So fibrothecoma is the most common one, but have in mind that a lot of sources describe fibromas and thecomas as separate because you can have them as separate entities. However, 
the most common type is having them combined. And you see here, there's a lot of playing with the names and the histologic diagnosis. And a lot of this might not, might not make sense initially. So we just need more data and more standardization as to what we're referring when we say one thing or the other. But as a general concept, just know that fibrothecomas uh, is the main one. You can either have a fibrous or, or uh, thecoma component. The same thing applies for sertoyelitic uh, cells uh, tumor that you can either have one or the other. But again, the combined type is a more more common one. And obviously, we have the granulosa cell tumor, which is also uh, a common a common one here. And we leave in the last 10%, and that's going to be for the metastatic disease of the ovary. So metastatic disease of the ovary, we need to know that a lot of it is going to be from the uterus. So primary uterine cancer can metastasize to the ovary. The stomach, and they, that's what they call the drop metastases. It can come from the colon, it can come from breast cancer, and even lymphoma. So we have different things that can uh, metastasize to the ovaries, and those are also important to know.